Next up on the number one tee. Well, hello and welcome back to your virtual tea time. My name is Tori and Jake, our producer here. Jake, can we help me with the mic? I feel like I'm going like this. But I showed up today and we had we're we're having a babes golf episode, but we're also we have Justin Klimbala here. Hi Justin. Hi Tori. Justin, every like once a month you get lucky with a room full of gorgeous women. <laughs> I am so lucky with babes golf. It's just like and they keep growing. I, I know. <laughs> Last time I just had like one or two babes. Now we got what seven babes in here today. I love it. No, I walked in today and knowing that Alex was going to be here, Sally was going to be here. I knew Tiffany was going to be here, and we have six babes here. Six. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hello. I'm doing good. How is everything going? Great. Well, we're all here because we're doing our first team retreat. I know. Tell us about it because I love that you did that. It's been amazing. It, I mean, we work a lot like virtually and we see each other once a week like on Zoom and everyone has so much to say in like one hour. So this has been amazing because we spent the last four days together just planning out the rest of the year and then 2024. So it's been really fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Hi, Sally. Hello. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm fabulous for usual. <laughs> And I also want to introduce Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Hold on. Let's. Hi, how are you? Now, Alex, can you remind us all how Babes Golf started? Because I, I know that you were the spearhead, but I also know that you had your, you know, best girl next to you, Catherine. So can you tell us how this all formed? Yeah. Well, Catherine, and I actually got set up on a golf date. We had a friend. He used to, he was a friend with Catherine, a friend with me, and he was telling me for about a year, like, I want to set you up with this girl that I know. She's just getting to golf. I'm like, okay, cool. Cause he's just like a bro. And you're like, okay, like <laughs> just sounds like everyone else. Like we'll set you up with someone, you know? So he was telling Catherine the same thing for about a year. And finally he set us up on a golf date and we've been best friends since. So yeah. Shout out to. <laughs> <laughs> Do we not want to say his name? Ty Raps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Hold on. And Catherine, sorry, we're sharing mics here, so it's a lot of switching. Catherine, what has Babes Golf brought to your life? Honestly, one of the biggest things is the camaraderie and the friendship. I was just getting into golf. I started golfing as a COVID golfer, was just doing it by myself, met Alex, met the babes, and I immediately had this instant group of friends, which honestly, in your 30s, it's so difficult to make friends and to meet people that are in the same realm of life and stage of life as you. And that has been absolutely huge. And I think that's one of the biggest things that has helped with Babes Golf. And it's like, when you know, you're going to go and have a good time with the people and not that the golf becomes secondary because I'm like very competitive now and I love it, but it makes it easier to want to go. It's not a chore or anything like that. And it's just become golf has become a huge passion in my life. And Babes Golf is such a big part of that. That's awesome. Okay, so I want to go around the go around the room here and everyone introduce themselves. I know Bernadette, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but also just to remind the listener that this is on YouTube also, so you'll be able to see everyone. So check out the YouTube channel, but just introduce yourself. How long have you been golfing and what was the biggest um, I, I want to do like an intimidation factor. Like what were you most intimidated by coming into golf? Just so that if there is a beginner golfer listening, they know that, okay, I can relate to that. And look at you ladies are still here rocking it on the golf course. So awesome. start us off um, Bernadette. I'm Bernadette. Um, I help Alex with the San Diego chapter and I got into golf about three years ago. I work at a golf course now and I learned from my boyfriend. I'd ride around with him and just got to the point where, you know, I'm tired of just riding around. I want to play. And so I started practicing. I watched a lot of videos. He's helped me a lot. And, um, you know, golf is just, you know, male dominated. It's going to be intimidating. It was scary to go on the range by myself, but, you know, I got, I gained the confidence in my swing and I just practiced and practiced. And, you know, I kept telling myself, you know, I, I belong here too. So I just got past that and my score started getting lower and I didn't need my boyfriend by my side anymore. So it was awesome. And I met the babes and it's just, it's been amazing. And now you're working in the industry. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Alex, we're going to make you go too. Go ahead. 
Remind everyone when you started golfing and what. I started golfing six years ago. Um, an ex-boyfriend introduced me to it and he, I, he taught me a lot. I was self-taught. I watched a lot of videos and I tried to figure out like by filming my swing and then looking at professional swings, like how to tweak things. And I really wish I started with a lesson, but I didn't know. So, um, self-taught for about the first year. And then when we broke up is when I was like, I just want my friends to start golfing. And so that's when I started just convincing like my closest friends to come to the range with me. And, um, that's when babes golf started. We, I just realized that there was a ton of women that wanted to learn. They didn't know where to start. And so, um, yeah, it started about five years ago and now I have a whole team of reps now, which is really cool. You're so lucky. All right, Sally, when did you start golfing and what was the biggest hurdle when you first started? Okay. So the first time I ever swung a club was when I was 14. My grandfather, I was, my parents kicked me out of the house for a couple of weeks. We're like, I'm done with you. Um, <laughs> Been there too. Yeah. I have checked that box. Yeah. One of many times <laughs> I went over there with a the trash bag over my shoulder. Like, all right, grandma, grandpa. My grandma's like, you want a sandwich? And my grandpa's like, let's go golf. So anyway, that was the first time and I loved it. I was hooked right away because, um, I just had this kind of natural swing, just being athletic, but then I didn't pick it up until I became a cart girl, um, on a course and I could golf for free intimidation for me. There was none because being a cart girl, I would sit there and watch men tee off all day and shank it, chunk it, oh my hit God, it thin. I love that. And I was like, <sighs> They suck. Everyone sucks. Mostly everyone <laughs> sucks, right? Everybody so, sucks. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. most women have this idea in their heads um, be, because it's male dominated that everyone on the course is good at golfing, and that's yeah. just not the case. Yeah. So, all right, next up. I'm Michelle, I'm and Michelle. I help with the operations at Babes Golf, and I have been golfing since I was 15. I'll let you guys guess how long ago that was. <laughs> and I started, I grew up in a country club environment. So I had all the resources available to me, which was wonderful. I played in high school. And I think my biggest challenge with golf was after I stopped playing after high school and didn't play for several years, finding a channel to get back into it and to find a community and people to golf with outside of just my family. And that didn't exist until Babes Golf came around. And it was actually my sister-in-law who was a member in San Diego. And I just followed Babes Golf patiently and waited for it to come to Orange County. And the day it came to Orange County, I went to the first event and I met Alex and I said, let's go. Like, what do I need to do? Like, <laughs> let's make this happen. first member of Orange County. Yeah. Yes. So it's been so awesome to get back into golf, um, to have people to golf with outside of just my family and it just bringing back all of the love I have for the sport. Thanks, Michelle. Catherine. So I was a total COVID golfer and I think the biggest intimidation factor was going to the range by myself, which obviously babes golf bridges that gap immensely. So that was absolutely now like there was a range right by my house. I go all the time, put my head, you know, and then I'm always afraid that people are going to like, try and talk to me or correct my forum or things, but really, honestly, it hasn't happened that much, which I do appreciate, but I still have a fear that I haven't conquered, but I'm going to do it this summer, which is just showing up to the golf course by myself and joining a foursome. So I've never yet done that. Same. So yeah, it's still, in, it intimidates, and I'm going to really push myself. I think I'm going to try and walk on at Tori and just like see who's there and see what happens. So, um, I'm excited for it because I, I know I can do it. I just I haven't, haven't done it yet. I am Tiffany and I am the AC rep for babes and I started golfing at about five. My dad didn't sit home and watch football or anything. We boated, we golfed, we did stuff like that. So I just naturally followed him out there and then same golfed in high school and then didn't golf forever. And then golf saved my life from depression. I golfed, we joined a country club and I golfed 300 days in the Northwest. That's amazing. Like we were out there in our rain gear New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, we golfed every day at our country club and um, went from a 35 handicap to a 17 in one year. And then we bought a cheerleading gym, quit golfing, and then came to Arizona. And now that's literally all we do. And I work for babes. So 
It's great. It, and my biggest intimidation, I think, in golf was just the start and stop. And so many times in my life, it's like you do pick it up, but then you also pick up bad habits. I think I was telling Justin before, I stand there at the tee box with 900 swing thoughts and then seven coaches that I've had in my life all in my head. So um, Coach Natalie was like, stop. You have one swing unless you're like with your wedge or your driver. Do the same exact thing every single cl- Like I've gotten like good tips, which helped me overcome that intimidation. Not really intimidated by boys or anything. I probably am a little lean towards Sally on just the being loud and confident thing. But yeah. Your golf team is getting- on fire right now. Oh my God, yes. this Sally being loud and confident thing. Me? Oh my goodness, that is spot on, Tiffany. Yeah. I forgot to say that I was the OC rep. Well, I'm like, oh, I, I forgot uh, to say that. Uh, no. So uh, that's funny that you said same swing from wedge to driver. That is actually, so many instructors tell me that, and it's the hardest thing for me to grasp. Yeah. Because it's like, no. It's not though. When right. I'm hitting a 60 yard shot wedge, it's completely different than my driver swing. Right. So it, like my brain can't comprehend that, Justin. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of tips come into like specifically for the 60 yard chip, you know, or versus the driver. There's like small little tidbits that you can do differently, but in general, it's the same swing that you're trying mm. to bring to every single club. Mm. Justin, will you introduce everyone or introduce yourself yes. to everyone, the listeners, just in case that this Absolutely. might be their first episode that they're listening. Yes, yes. My name's Justin Klumbala. I am. Uh, I'm actually partners with Tori in a great group called Breaking Bogies, and uh, and I'm also the director of instruction at two different uh, clubs. One here in the Valley, and then uh, in Phoenix at Paradise Valley Country Club, and then in right now, currently in the summer, I'm in Flagstaff at Forest Highlands Golf Club. So lucky enough to escape the heat and get to 30 degree cooler weather up there, and. Uh, yeah, so. We're very lucky to have him here as our resident expert instructor. He loves golf. He loves golf. He loves teaching the go- golf technique. I don't know how you do it, Justin. I really don't. <laughs> I, I don't know how you come up with the patience to do it, but that is your gift. So today we are going to be diving into the 10. I told him 10 misconceptions, but he came up with 13, of Actually, course. Actually, 14. I added one. Oh, okay. Yeah, 14. The, <laughs> big- <laughs> uh, the biggest misconceptions of the golf swing. So he's going to kind of be going over full swing, chipping, putting, bunkers, misconceptions that we have about the golf swing. So Justin, kick us off. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And when you texted me about it, I was like, I got this oh, see, because <laughs> look at the excitement that Justin has about the golf swing. Well, see. well, as as uh, some of the listeners may know or not, but uh, my my mentor and the person who brought me into the uh, who I learned the most from is uh, a guy named Jim McLean, and I worked for him for six years. But that was part of the reason why I was in actually in Palm Desert for a while. I worked for him at PGA West and La Quinta Resort and Club, which I know Babe's Golf has a presence out there. But um, he wrote a book called The Eight Step Swing Book, and in one of the chapters in there is the misconceptions of golf. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there. And uh, I went through the list that he had and I picked out the ones that I thought were the ones that I think most people have a huge misconception with. Number one that I have on my list is lifting the left heel off the ground. So if you've ever made a golf swing for a right-handed golfer, we're told that we have to keep that left heel down uh, uh, on the ground. But um, a lot of the things that Jim McLean has learned from was actually studying the, the the tour players, both LPGA and PGA. And we used to do swing studies. We'd look at 100 swings and, and study a specific part. And let's just talk about the left heel off the ground. When we studied that, we found actually 40% of them actually lifted their left heel off the ground. And actually, I just recently did a speed school at um, down here in the Valley for, for some of the members, and I had nine people sign up for it. And probably the biggest swing tip that I was giving to people to get more speed in their power was to lift the left heel and then, and then crush it back down as if you were going to crush a Coke can under your left heel. It's a humongous power source. Now, 
Every once in a while, we get one of those. If you're looking at my hands here as the uh, as the feet, we'll get like a beginner golfer that's like lifting their foot completely off the ground. For somebody like that, that and keeping their left heel on the ground would be a good thought for them. But if you can lift that left heel just a little bit and then crush that Coke can underneath that left heel, it just gives you all that extra power to hit into the golf ball. And it's a fantastic swing tip to do, not to avoid, which is what a lot of people think you have to do. Does anyone here lift their front front? You do. And, and has any, well, better question. Has anybody here been told not to lift yeah. their left? Yeah. Heel? Oh yeah. Me. Yeah. And yeah. that's why these misconceptions come out a little bit more because we're told like we shouldn't be doing these things, but after doing the research and that's what, you know, Jim, Jim's, um, quote was those who don't do research have nothing to teach. So, you know, if you really research it though, we found that 40% of the best players in the world are actually lifting their left heel in the backswing. So I feel like Scotty Scheffler right now is lifting both feet multiple Man, times guy, during that swing. He, I'm surprised he's even upright at the end of his swing. He's fallen over all the time. I mean, it's the most, it's the ugliest golf swing I've ever seen. In my life. I mean, it's horrible, and, but, but the number one player in the world. So, it just shows that like, you know, I mean, having a good looking golf swing is extremely overrated, you know, and mm-hmm. so many people think you have to have a good looking swing or if something in your swing looks quirky that like, that's what's holding you back from being better. A lot of the times it's not. And a lot of the times trying to change something in your swing just because it looks quirky actually makes you worse over, over a period of time. Yeah. All right. Number two, number two, setting up parallel to your target line. Everyone thinks that you have to set up perfectly parallel to your target line and line up straight. Some of the best players in the world didn't do this. Lee Trevino uh, is somebody who aimed about 30 yards, 40 yards left of his target. Sam Snead was someone who aimed 30 to 40 yards right of his target. And both of them are actually coined as being two people that own their golf swing more than anybody. And then another reason why I wrote this thing down is that most of the time, um, a quote from Jack Nicholas once said, the hardest shot in the world to hit is a straight shot. Hitting a, per- a perfectly straight shot is incredibly hard. So you should actually be trying to play for some type of curvature. So if you are a fader of the golf ball or a slicer of the golf ball, that's actually really good because you have a consistency to your curve and you should just be aiming left and playing for that curve. If you're one that draws the ball quite a bit, then you should be aiming right. So if our goal is to actually have a consistent curve to our ball and not try to achieve the impossible, which is hitting a perfectly straight ball all the time, we actually should really never be aiming at our target. We should be aiming slightly right or slightly left, depending on what your typical miss is. So I loved that. And Justin, with aiming, as far as aiming towards whatever target you're, you're using, is it lining your feet up to that target? Is it lining the club face? Is it lining up your shoulder? Yes. I talk about this all the time. The biggest difference between a good player and a poor player. And if if anything, you just wanted to look like a better player. You don't even have to be a better player. If you just wanted to look like a better player, you should aim your club face first and then aim your body second. Yeah. Poorer players are the ones with the clubs on their shoulders and their knees trying to get their body to aim correctly. And if this you, don't worry about it. <laughs> now you'll be better. But, no. but aiming that face, getting the face to point where you want it to go, and then setting your body parallel to the face is absolutely the best way to get yourself more lined up instead of worrying so much about where your hips and your knees and your shoulders and everything are. So being very specific, face first and body second, will be a better way to line up, and it makes you look like a better player, which is what we're all out here to be doing. So part of my routine forever has been to just line up using my body first instead of my club face. So I'm in the process now of trying to reverse that, of doing the club face first. And it is so hard. It is so hard to break that habit because even like I'll start practicing it at the range, aiming the club face first. And it's like, okay, okay. But when I get out in the course, I almost want to fall back to that comfort of For my sure. old routine For sure. or really it's not even my old routine. It's still really my main routine of just doing body first and then club face. So it's really hard to, to change a routine that you've been using for so long. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, change is extremely difficult. It's very, very hard. 
Um, and there's a great story about trying to change technique and how it's very difficult to do. And the story is, is if you, if you were all just to decide, okay, we're going to enter this very unique race this summer. And this race is how to run backwards. We are all going to run backwards and we're going to train this entire summer to learn how to tr- run backwards. We're going to get a coach. We're going to learn how to put our legs where we go. We're training for, let's say months. It's races coming up in October. But we go for a hike in September. We've been training for months on how to run backwards. And as we're going through the hike through the woods, all of a sudden a bear shows up and we have to run. Who's running backwards? Nobody. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone's turning around and running straight and getting the heck out of there, right? So um, that's what happens when we're trying to change technique and trying to change things in our swing. Sure, we can do it on the range. Sure, we can do it in front of a coach. But when the bear shows up, the golf course, (laughs) we're like, screw this. I'm going back to what I already know how to do. Yeah. Yeah. So changing technique is very, very difficult. Yeah. Okay, on to number three. All right, number three, uh, keeping your left arm straight. This was a really big one. So, uh, And this, again, is if you're right-handed. Yeah, everything's about being right-handed, but keeping your left arm straight in the backswing. We studied this at the top. Oh, well, our crew at Jim McLean's Golf School studied this, and of the top 100 players, 95% of them had a bent left arm at the top of their swing. 95%. So it was almost a fundamental that you should be bending your left arm. So there's so many people that think this needs to be so yeah. perfectly straight. And you see people that are just like hyper extending their left elbow to just try to keep it so incredibly straight. And it's just not something that you really need to do. And, uh, and, and the less tension you have in your swing is so much more worth it. Now, the term that we, uh, that we typically use is more having your left arm relatively straight. So yes, if you were going back like this and bending your elbow to like 90 degrees or even more than that, then yes, that person should probably think about keeping their left arm a little bit straighter, but it does not need to be absolutely perfectly straight. Um, Number four, grip position should be a certain way. So a lot of times, especially in beginner clinics, we teach like a very general neutralized grip, but there's actually very few people that actually need that. There's, there's people that, 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 um, that benefit from a stronger grip, having their hands rotated clockwise on the club face. And then there's some people that benefit from a little bit more of a weaker grip, which is counterclockwise on the club face. So uh, thinking that everyone should have the same exact grip is absolutely incorrect. And actually, there's a lot of people that I'll put into kind of like a, let's say, just a really strong grip if they're a slicer. And they're like, oh, is this a Band-Aid? No, there's actually some really great players that play with really strong grips. So knowing which is the correct grip for you is very important and not thinking that there's this one correct grip that everyone should have because there's great players that have all sorts of different grips. And there's even a great player uh, out there named Josh Broadway that played on the mini tours that played cross-handed. So uh, there's even great players that have played cross-handed. I'm not recommending that to anybody to try, but I'm just saying that there's different ways that you can grip the club. Has anyone struggled with their grip before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Catherine and I, I just sent her an article, and it it was about slicers for some reason. There's this guy that loves to send me articles about slicing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I understand why. Okay. So I actually sent it to Catherine and she tried the technique yesterday yeah. on the range. I changed my grip. I changed my grip last year, which I actually love how it is now. My irons are so much better, but I have been slicing my drives to the point that I won't hit driver off the T box right now. And we were at Dobson yesterday and I was like, I'm going to try that. And I, is it weaker that or stronger? stronger? I went, I made my grip a little bit stronger and just, straight, totally straight. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm the kind of person that's like, I want to do all of it correctly. I need to learn to hit this correctly. And I think, well, you can either slice it or you can hit it straight or relatively straight and hit the fairway instead of losing your ball now. So now I'm actually really excited to go to the range and just practice that. Um, it was a really well written article, but it was Tony Finau. yeah, Yeah. He talked about how you just move your right hand underneath the, um, underneath the yeah. head more like yeah. yeah underneath the grip yeah, yeah underneath the grip. Right, Just a touch. right hand more under and left hand on top yeah. is yep. what, what makes it a stronger grip mm-hmm. and it made a big difference and it's funny because i i even like my ego gets in the way like i said of wanting to like do it the right way but i'm also like but this is okay whatever works it's like we talked about putting or if you're not good with chipping we've talked about this before like using your seven iron or something instead of like freaking out that you're gonna chip it poorly you know so just figuring out what works right now. 
I love that. And and I love the realization that you, you came to when it's like, Oh, I should, I need to do it the correct way. That's true. You should do it the correct way, but the correct way for you and realizing that not everybody fits into this neutral, everyone being perfectly here, everyone having a perfectly on plane backswing, not everybody even aims straight. So it's like finding what is perfect for you and customized to you. And that's awesome, Catherine. That's awesome. Um, Okay. Number five, golf is a left-sided game. Has anybody ever heard that before that you should be feeling like you're pulling with your left side? I haven't. But I think I oh, like that. Perfect. Well, uh, it's yeah. the misconception. So, so. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it, it it's good for some people. So if you're somebody who actually hooks the ball a mm-hmm. lot, pulling with the left side can help keep the face a little bit more square. But but uh, but there's actually a lot of great players that actually throw more with their right side. And if you're one that's trying to pull with your left side, if you look at your left hand at the top of the swing, I I don't have a lot of power here to be able to do this. I can't really do this really powerfully, but my right hand is in such a more throwing position. I actually call this like when I'm teaching this technique with people, I call it the pizza pie holding position. Get trying to get your right hand in a pizza pie holding position here, which is in such a better throwing position that you can have so much more power from your right side. But there's so many people that hit a bad shot and they're like, oh I got my right hand into it. It was my right hand my right side's the problem. It's not the problem. There's actually a lot of power in that right side that we should be al- allowed to use. So, um, so golf is not always a left-sided game, and some of the best players in the world have actually allowed their right hand to be in- involved with that. And then also, I think too, a lot of people just think using your right side is very aggressive. And most people usually say when they hit a bad shot, "Oh, I swung too hard there," or "I swung too aggressively there." You know. And actually, I th- I find most people are actually struggling out on the golf course because they're too conservative. They're not aggressive enough. They're not going for it. They're swinging into a negative picture of not wanting to top in front of people or not wanting to hit a bad shot in front of people. So they tighten up and swing more conservatively and actually pump the brakes coming into impact, which then actually causes the problems. So we want to free up that right side to allow that to swing through the club. Of course. Um, So yes, the power is coming from the right, but I'm always told like you, like, but you're still leading with your left, like, right, like getting down and under. Like, that's what I've been taught because I miss that where, like, my husband's like, well, you're, you need to, like, be pushing out with your left hand. Is that the misconception you're talking about? Yep. Okay. Yep. But, th- but I'm not saying that, but, but there are some people that actually get some great, um, great results feeling more of pulling with their left side. Yeah. The reason why this is a misconception is that it's not for everybody. Yeah. A lot of times people put these ideas out there that like, oh, yes, everyone should be gripping the club the same way. Everyone should be swinging left-sided. Everyone should be keeping their left heel on the ground. It's not necessarily uh, true for everybody. And that's yeah. why we call it a misconception because it's not something that is going to benefit everybody. There are some people that do f- get some benefit from, from, yeah. from pulling with the left side, but it's not for everybody. And that's why I mean, it's a misconception. Perfect. Yeah. It sounds like something that would help with over the top. Yes. That, that saying. Correct. Yeah. Because a lot of people get their right hand to be too much going over this way. So mm-hmm. if they pulled more with their left, it would allow the golf club to drop more to the inside yeah. for sure. But once that golf club does drop, we actually do want to allow that right hand to now apply the power instead of holding back, you know, and, and, and playing, like I said, just extremely conservatively. A lot of people just feel like they can't allow their right hand to be in at all. And it's just such a stressful way to swing of just like trying to keep your right hand on it. The right hand's on the golf club and it's set up for a very powerful yeah. position. It's like, why not use it? Why not use it to create more power? Yes, we want the club to be in the right plane, but then from there, let that thing really release. release. Let it rip. All right. All right. Next All right. up. <laughs> uh, next up is going to be taking the club straight off the ball and swinging down the line. So a lot of people think that the, the club goes straight back and straight through. But the game of golf is actually swung on, on a circle. And actually one of the most complicated books of all time. So if you wanted to really get really complicated, don't do this. But <laughs> there's a book called The Golfing Machine, which is a, a very, very highly technical book. But they actually said that the word golf stands for 
geometrically oriented linear force, which shows you how it comp- complicated the, the, the golf We've heard many is. other definitions <laughs> yeah. to yeah. what golf means, but yes, yes. okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, geometrically oriented. So we're trying to swing in a circle. If the edge of this table was kind of the straight line that we're swinging on, and we're trying to swing in a circle up and in, down, down into the ball, and then back up and in again, which then creates the linear force. But a lot of times people are trying to swing on this linear force and trying to guide the club down the, down the target line. But we actually need to be a little bit more committed to the actual circle, which then creates the linear force to go straight. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Still trying to figure that one out, yeah. but hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, a well, mecha- more mechanical way to think about it. Well, and you see those uh, swing trainers that are actual circles that you, that yep. you yeah, yeah, yeah. The swing club. plane are, yeah. Is that what it's yep. called? The swing plane? Yeah. When I whenever I use that, I'm like, this feels so weird. Yes. It's like my club is totally off plane most of the time <laughs> yes. if this is how it's supposed to feel. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and that is sometimes funny about that thing because it really does make you almost perfectly on plane and it sometimes feels a little bit awkward to swing yeah. swing yeah. that back and through. But sometimes it's a good feel to have because it kind of shows you where you should be instead of where you are. Um, number seven, keep your head down after impact. So uh, who here has ever topped a ball and heard we have to keep our head down, right? Oh yeah. Everybody. Right. So, uh, keeping our head down, it's probably the number one thing that I find that is not the reason why we actually top the ball. One of the biggest ones that I tend to show a lot of people is that if you grip the golf club and you can do this at home, if you're just in a room or somewhere, you know, and holding a golf club. But if you're holding a golf club and just put the club on the ground, and then when you squeeze as hard as you possibly can, go from like a four grip pressure on a scale of one to 10, and then go to like a 10, what it does is it contracts all your muscles and it actually raises the golf club off the ground by just about an inch, which is enough to top the ball. That's me still keeping my head down. That's still me keeping my arms straight, but me just squeezing tighter tends to raise the golf club. And I actually had another mentor named Michael Hebron, who I worked for in uh, 2008. And he used to say, just simply telling somebody directions creates stress. So the moment that you tell somebody that they have to do something to be successful, that all of a sudden creates stress. What does stress create? Tension. Tension creates that squeeze. So when you're telling someone, keep your head down. Oh, you picked up your head again. Keep your head down. You're just like infusing so much stress in this person that all they're going to do is just squeeze harder and harder and continue to top and my poor mother I tell you when I was teaching my mom when I was in high school I only knew about keeping my head keeping your head down so she topped the ball mom you're picking up your head okay I'm gonna try to keep it down she tops again mom you're picking up your head she got to the point where she was gluing her <laughs> chin to her chest and then she swung like this and then she topped the ball and you know what I would say you picked up your head. That's the one thing she didn't do. She absolutely kept her head down, but still topped the ball. But it's not the main reason why we tend to top the ball. It's usually because of tension and usually because of fear of hitting the ground. So most people want to just hit the ball only and not hit the ground. You must hit the ground. And actually, when I, I've been doing this with a lot of my lessons just recently, I ask people, what are you looking at when you're hitting the golf ball? They said, I'm looking at the golf ball. And I said, would you, would you say, though, for these last 20 balls that you've hit, which have been a handful of good and bad shots, would you say that you've hit the golf ball every single time? And they'd say, yeah, I have. So, so you, you hit the ball every single time. And there's like a 1% time that you whiff, but almost always we hit the ball. But the really great shots are when you're hitting the grass just slightly in front of the golf ball, which is where you should be looking when you're hitting the golf ball. You shouldn't be looking at the ball. You should be looking at what is our actual goal. It's to hit the ground in front. So if there's a common denominator between all great shots, it's hitting the ground slightly in front. And when good players are striking the golf ball, whether they're consciously thinking about it or subconsciously thinking about it, their ultimate aim point is to hit the ground in front of the ball. And the ball just simply gets in the way. So it's not looking at the ball. It's actually looking slightly in front Mm. of the ball. So number eight, number eight, Swinging a barrel. So if we've ever, anybody ever heard that term before? Yep. I've used that as a swing thought before. So swinging in a barrel is almost as if you had a barrel around your hips and you have to stay inside of the barrel as you're swinging back and through. Now swinging in a barrel is a fantastic thought for the backswing. I think it's awesome for the backswing because it keeps you, because a lot of people slide their hips to the right in the backswing for a right-handed golfer again. And that's not a great move. We want to feel a little bit more rotation, but in the downswing, 
what we have found is that with the greatest players in the world, they're moving their, their, their hips anywhere from six to eight inches laterally to the left as they're coming through. So they're almost busting through that barrel. They're not actually staying in the barrel. So they're actually busting through the barrel. And the number one reason why most people hit the ball fat, and for those of you who don't know what fat is, it's when the ball, when you're coming in to hit the ball and you hit the ground behind the ball and it kills all your energy before you go into the golf ball. If that if that's you, usually it's because we don't have enough weight into our left side. We usually want about 70 to 80% of our weight into our left side at the moment of impact, which actually helps us get that divot in front. But we do need to bust through that barrel. And actually I utilize this so interesting trying to explain all these golf terms no. without actually having to move around. <laughs> it's okay. You're doing great. <laughs> but uh, a term that I use a lot to help people bust through that barrel is that at the top of their swing, if they're having a tough time getting into that left side and getting that divot out in front, uh, I pretend like we have groceries in our hand and we forgot to shut the car door. <laughs> which is really I, I tried to that. tell this to yes. Bernadette the other day and it didn't work it very well. <laughs> okay, wait, explain that one more time. I think that's a gem. Oh yeah. The oh, grocery thing. Yeah. yeah the so, grocery thing. So, yeah. so you're trying, well, so the, the person is here. trying, so, yeah, but trying to, so, yeah, you get up here to the top and you're trying to shut the car door. <laughs> so trying, trying to get that. That's left cute. All in the head. <laughs> Thank you. But that's <laughs> making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> we always, that always happens. With just, okay. <laughs> but if they, they're struggling transferring their weight from the back to the front, that's that thought might that help. That thought will help to get the weight to the left side. And then the other thing I've been trying to tell a lot of people, which actually helps people stay in the barrel in the backswing, is not to get such a big shift to the right. So if you're starting off 50-50 in your, in your weight distribution, and then you swing to the top of your swing, try to see if you can maintain 50-50. So don't mm. try to move so much weight to the right, because think about it. If you need 70 to 80% on your left foot at the moment of impact and you move 70 to 80% to the right, look how much farther you have to shut that car door to get back to your left side versus if I'm just staying 50, 50, now you only have to move about 30% of that my weight there to get that, get, to get that good shot. So that big move off the ball, I think is a big problem where I think swinging in a barrel is a great thought, but on the downswing, we do want to bust through that barrel and hit and get through to that left side. I like that. Um, <clears throat> number nine. Number nine. Oh, we're almost oh. over. Oh, no, it's just... We're having so much fun. <laughs> All right. So start, uh, starts, starts with your hands ahead. Oh, starting with your hands ahead of the ball with all shots. Has, has everyone heard about starting with your hands ahead of the ball? Go ahead. Yeah, like to create lag. Mm -hmm. That's yep. what I would think. Yep. Have yeah. you guys heard like... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting, starting with our hands ahead of the ball. So it's a fantastic thought usually for, uh, for irons or anything like that, but it's a humongous problem for driver. So if you're one that's like has this huge forward press with a driver, it actually creates a lot of problems because it makes your attack angle come more down on the ball. The one golf club in our bag that we actually want to hit up on the ball because it is on a nice tall tee is a driver. So a lot of times with the driver, I'm actually telling people that we want to have the, the butt end of the club to actually point at the belly button uh, instead of having it leaning so far forward. So having that just being a little bit more neutral and instead of starting with our hands so far forward. What kind of miss will you see if you do, if you're hitting a driver and your hands are too far forward? Low ball flight or pop-ups. Mm, okay. Low ball flight or pop-ups. So yeah, if you're looking to try to get more height on the ball, and to be honest, one of the big secrets to getting more distance on your drive is getting more height. We want that ball to be sailing very, very high up into the air. Um, a lot of people think low ball flight gives you more roll. Yes, it does, but you're also sacrificing it. Uh, carry distance. So a full distance of a driver is your carry distance plus the rollout. So let's just say if you shot it lower, you'd get maybe 15 yards more of roll. You're giving up about 30 yards of carry to get that 15 yards extra roll. Mm -hmm. So it's a net loss at the end of the day. So we want that height to be up there. So getting our head behind the ball and particularly the grip behind the ball will help you launch that ball up higher into the air and get that more distance. Grip okay. behind the ball on the driver? Mm -hmm. Wow. Grip behind the ball on That's the driver. That's good to know. Michelle was like, that's what your problem was. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe that's what your problem was. <laughs> I can hit a pretty long drive, but there were a few times that we've been golfing together recently that my ball just went boop straight in the air. And I was not teeing it 
way high in the right. air or anything. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. So it's usually a downward angle you. attack. <laughs> now then, I know. Yeah. And then hitting the ground. We want to, uh, so a lot of times too, if someone's popping it up, the, the greatest thoughts that really help you is that you're usually, if this is my driver head and coming in to hit the T and let's just imagine there was a ball on top of my T here, it's usually somebody coming in and hitting too much of the T, which then makes the ball hit the top of the driver. So a lot of times if someone's popping it up a lot, I'll just say, okay, on this next one, I want to see if you can hit the ball only without hitting the tee at all. And that usually allows them to rise the club just a little bit high enough so that they do get the ball more in the center of the face. So that tip actually will really help me too, because I am trying to get more lag in my irons and um, trying to get my hands a little more in front Mm -hmm. at impact Mm -hmm. because right now it's straight. Does that make sense? Yep. And knowing that that's not how it's supposed to be with the driver, you know, that, that does help. Yeah. And actually, let's just jump back to the irons just for a quick, quick second. I've actually found a, a tip to really help people get more lag is actually not starting with your hands so far forward and actually imagining your swing kind of like a paintbrush. So if I had a paintbrush here and I had to paint the wall back this way and then paint the ball wall back this way, mm. it actually gives me more lag at impact. So if I actually felt more of this in the backswing, it actually helps me lag it more when I come back into impact. Where a lot of people sometimes I've seen a ton that start really forward thinking that that's where they mm-hmm. want to be at impact. Mm-hmm. They swing back and then they dump yes. it. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> I just had a moment. Light bulb. Uh, yeah, that just, that uh-huh. just happened. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Oh, All right, absolutely. number 10. Number 10. Hey, we're getting into the short game. All right, so bunker. The club face should point at the target and then swing across your body. So has anybody ever heard that before? So when we open the club face, Obviously, let's just say the target was, you know, right, right ahead of us here. If I open up the club face, it's pointing 45 degrees in the wrong direction. So we've been told a lot to try to aim to the left and then swing across our body to -hmm. make the ball go towards our target. When we're in the bunker, particularly, and especially when we open up that club face, uh, it's actually better to stand square. Even though this face is pointing in the wrong direction, when you swing through, the club will actually go more in the direction of your path than it will the face. And actually, a lot of times people are cutting across it way too much. I had a student the other day that just had a super wide open face. He was cutting across it like 45 degrees. And all he did was slide right under the ball and the ball would pop up and only go like a couple of feet. So I squared him up and actually had him coming more from the inside, still with that open face, but the ball still popped out very straight and he had made so much better contact. So this idea that we have to have the face open and then opening up and then swinging across it is a huge misconception for the bunker. So I actually heard this. I was watching, um, I want, maybe it was during the U.S. Open. I'm not sure. But I, I remember hearing the commentator say that most of the professional golfers now are square yes. to their target Correct. in the bunker now. Yep. That seems to be a huge change Mm -hmm. so what was the belief before like why weren't they hitting left then of their target when they were doing it before yeah that's true um I think uh, I think a lot of times because they they were were basically holding the face more open and really trying to almost direct the club Mm -hmm. ball ball to where they were trying to go where now when they're squarer uh, and actually, to be honest, when the face is nice and open, it's hard to kind of show you here, but because the face is open, it's so close to 90 degrees that uh, even when I open it up, the face still points straight. If I was square, the, cl- the face would point straight. So it actually goes straight either way, whether you aim the face at your target or you leave it to the right. Mm-hmm. But the thing that you're sacrificing is the path, the path going so much to the left is what's making this not as efficient of a hit where when you're coming more from the inside and standing more square, your, your, your path is actually coming in and actually making a much more efficient hit. So the answer to that of why it wasn't going left or yeah, going left was that whether you, whether you have the face open or it's actually square to the target, they, because it's so much towards 90 degrees, they're actually going, the, the, the ball is going to go towards the target in in both scenarios. Yeah. Okay, sorry to confuse you. I know it's hard not having a club no here. <laughs> no All right, number 11. 11, hands ahead when chipping and pitching. Okay, so when, we, oh. when we're hitting a chip shot or a pitch shot, having our hands ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, hu- Almost de- like de-lofting it. Yeah, huge, huge misconception there because you get rid of all the bounce. Once again, I 
Where's my big wedge <laughs> that I had? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when you have your hands too far ahead, you're getting rid of bounce, which, which is where that back edge is lower than the front edge of, of the bottom of the golf club. So when you lean your hands forward quite a bit on chipping or pitching, it just digs into the ground really, really hard. So if you've ever hit a, go- hit a chip or a pitch shot and it digs into the ground and gets stuck, it's usually because that your hands are too far ahead and the face is too closed. So we actually typically want to see when you're hitting chip shots and pitch shots is the shaft being very, very neutral, which means that it's straight up and down and not so much leaning forward, which then allows you to utilize the bounce and not get the club to dig into the ground as much. That just changed my whole... Yes. Does that make a difference if you put the ball at the back of your stance? Yeah, that's true. Uh, So yeah, it's okay if it leans a little bit forward. Yeah, if it's in the back of your stance, but, um, um, but I would... Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do that, then it's okay. Yeah, but if, if it's you're in the standing, back of your stance, yeah. it's okay to have your hands forward. But I've had I've had students that are like leaning their hands like extremely forward because they were told to keep their hands forward. There's a little bit of room and some wiggle room to lean it forward just a little bit. So if it's in the back of your stance, I typically say we always want the button of the club to point somewhere around your belly button or just slightly ahead of your belly button. But there's been people that I've had that are leaning the shaft forward where the shaft is pointing left of their body which is just incredibly too much shaft lean. So we, we, can, we can live with a little bit of shaft lean uh, when the ball's in the back of our stance, and that's totally fine. Uh, but if we're too excessive, that's when we start to run into some trouble. And when you just start golfing and you're getting instruction, is that an easier way to teach chipping? Is it, is it you're set up for more success and better contact when you're just starting? Yes. So, when so you're just starting? really, really big beginner, uh, really beginner golfers, beginner, beginner are trying to lift the ball into the air. So they they get in here and they're trying to lift it by scooping it with their hands. And for those particular people, having their hands a little bit more forward and trying to keep their hands forward is a fantastic idea. And you know, and, and this is a great point to make too. There's every swing thought that's ever been told has helped somebody somewhere out there. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to critique ideas because somewhere along the line, it has helped somebody, even if it, even if it was incorrect information, it helps somebody. And at the end of the day, that's what swing tips and golf advice is trying to do. We're trying to help people. And in the golf instructor world, there's a lot of people that just kind of get on top of everybody and really try to like disprove other people's theories but at the end of the day there's some great thoughts that's going to work for somebody Mm -hmm. and it's really hard to critique a lot of things um best sand thing right now from tori i think it was in our class which is amazing and everybody should be doing breaking bogeys i'll plug it for you because it's (laughs) it was so fun like when we went down to palm desert last week with my husband he's like what the heck and i was like i don't know you just keep telling me these things and it's awesome the best (laughs) thing you told me tori we were like stop worrying, just get it out of the sand. And I was literally at one point last year, just throwing my ball out. Cause I was, I didn't want to make <laughs> the men wait. And so I was like, I'll just throw it out. And now every time I hit it out and all I think in my head is get it out of the sand. Yep. And it always goes out now. I have so much confidence. In I wish sand. that like, worked that for was, me. <laughs> <laughs> literally like just start thinking like, I, I just take Parker. what he said and then just think that like, just get it out of the sand. So now I'm not worried if, is it going to go right by the cup? No, I'm not worried about it. I just need to get out of the sand. And it's literally going by the cup now. Like it's, it's taking all the fear out of it. Why we're scared of golf swings, who knows, but we are. And it's, it's awesome. That's yes. so such a good tip Absolutely. to add to what you just said is yes. just get it out. Just get it out. Yeah. yeah. We do get bogged down and trying to get near the flag. And, 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 and to be honest, even at the P, at PGA and LPGA tour level, uh, at the very best, they're getting up and down out of a bunker, meaning a Sandy one sand shot and a putt. 50% of the time that's at best. So they're not doing it the majority of the time. And those are the best players in the world. So really for us to even be expecting ourselves to get a Sandy, uh, is just, it's too high of an expectation. And when we're trying to force ourselves into this really tight, um, stressful situation of trying to get up and down that tension ends up making us mess up the bunker shot and we don't get out. If you're just trying to get out in one, get it anywhere out of the, out of the bunker is a fantastic way to think about it. Yeah. 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 All right. Number, are we on 12 or 11? (laughs) Number 12, only three more. Okay, (laughs) here we go. Uh, Reading break with only your eyes, reading break with only your eyes. So how many times do we get behind the ball and we just use our eyes to see which side is going left or right? Uh, going to the midpoint of our putt and straddling the putt. If any of you have ever heard of the term aim point, it's a style of reading greens, but 
the elementary version is just going to the midpoint of your putt, straddling your putt and actually feeling the ground with your feet. You can actually learn a lot more about the slope that you're about to putt over, feeling it with your feet than just using your eyes. What side of a putt do you think is the most beneficial? Like if you, is it just behind it? Do you, do you think, a, is it in front of it? I even think the side, yep. like looking at it from the side and really seeing the elevation and, and if it's downhill, uphill level. Yeah. So if you're flat, if your Celsius can is the, uh, is the, the ball, is the ball, no, the, the flag, we'll okay. say that's the flag. And then we're yep. putting from this, uh, cup holder here yep. or coaster. If we're putting in this direction, it's great to look from the side to see if the putt is uphill or downhill. So that's when that's the greatest place to see whether it's uphill or downhill. Let's say it's a downhill putt. Okay. We decide it's a downhill putt. From there, it's best to go from behind the hole and read from there. Why? Because we can see breaks so much better looking uphill than we can looking down. For those of you that are local in Arizona, think about Camelback Mountain. If you're down, below Camelback Mountain looking up, you can see every crevice, every detail, every texture of Camelback, and it looks like a camel. You can see everything. You climb up to the top of the Camelback Mountain and try to look down, you don't see all that texture anymore. You don't see all the stuff about it. So we always want to be looking uphill. So if I was to look at it from a multiple sides, once again, you always have to be thinking about pace of play. You have to be playing fast. So if you're taking forever to read your greens, nobody's going to want to play with you. So don't take too long. That was my thought. You just read my mind. Yes. Um, and, and, and a tip on that is people most, the people that are slow at reading greens are the ones that wait till it's their turn to read the green. You need to start reading the green as soon as possible. And actually you get some really good vantage points if you start reading your green the moment that you take your putter out of your bag because now you're walking up from a very far area from your ball and you can see so much more from farther back once again Camelback Mountain when we're farther away we can see so much more of the picture than when we're standing right on top of it so from the side uphill or downhill if it's downhill I go from behind the hole to look look up the hill to see the crevices a little bit more if it's an uphill putt then I go behind the ball and I look from there yeah Perfect. Um, All right, this 13. One, this one leads into 13. Uh, the putt breaks to the city. Have you ever heard that before? That the putt or the, the water, ocean yeah. or the water. Yep. So, um, so that's a bit of a misconception because um, it all comes down to the slope. So if the water's over here and I have a hill that's like this and I'm putting on this hill like this, it's gonna break away from the ocean. There's no way this is gonna go up a hill and towards the ocean because somebody said that it goes to the ocean. It's a big, big misconception. Now, I always say this with an asterisk, if ever I have a caddy, oh, oh, sorry. If you ever see someone that looks like it goes one way and then it ends up breaking towards the ocean, um, if you were to go up there and feel it with your feet, you can actually feel that the slope is actually going towards the ocean. It's not, there was an optical illusion. And that's why the misconception number three, they're reading only with your eyes is that your eyes can throw, can play some tricks on you. So we always want to go to that midpoint and feel it with our feet. And anytime that it does break towards the ocean or breaks towards the, the city or whatever like that, anytime that that actually is true, usually when you go up and feel it with your feet, it is, the slope is actually going there. Now, when I have a caddy and they tell me, Hey, this one looks like it's going left, but it's going to break to the city. I 100% believe the caddy because they are professional readers of the green. Just their reasoning of the fact that this city has some magical power over golf balls that they're pulling it to the city. <laughs> There's just no magical power out there. It's the slope of the green that's actually making it turn. Yeah. And All then right. number 14, my last one. That you added. That I added last. 42 minutes ago. 42 minutes ago. <laughs> Are we almost at it? No, no, we're totally fine. Okay. okay. Um, and this is, this is my favorite one. And I just added here and it's actually a huge um, kind of theme of breaking bogeys is that you have to improve your technique to improve your score. And that's not necessarily true. There's a whole new kind of concept of looking at the game of golf that we have been sharing with our breaking bogeys um, students that, you can actually play better golf and score better by having a better practice plan and looking at the game just a little bit differently with your strategy around the golf course. Just changing your strategy and the drills that you do in your practice, we can we cannot even touch your technique and 
you can lower your scores without having to change your technique. And a lot of times, once again, going back to our running backwards technique, changing technique is incredibly hard. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn to just score better just with your current technique, it's a lot less stressful. It's a lot less heartache and you get much faster results without having to change everything about your own swing because uh, another example that we tend to say a lot is that you usually have a tension problem not a technique problem and when you make a swing and you hit the worst shot of your life out on the golf course a lot of times we throw down a second ball and say oh I'm better than that and the second ball is perfect that just proves to you right there you don't have a technique problem it's more of a tension problem and your technique is just fine it's just learning how to use that technique yeah I have a question yes. really quick since you're here yeah um, I've been told by, I, I've only had four lessons my, my entire golf. That's pretty good though. I mean, I, that, I mean, at least you've had four. Yes. And then involuntary on the mm-hmm. driving range or whatnot. But, um, <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that. I don't know what you're trying to tell me. But anyway, um, I've had an instructor tell me, which I've tried to do this is take two pa- practice swings before every single shot. But for me, I'm ADHD, and so I feel like it. those are my good swings. Yep. <laughs> and then my third swing is a chunk, or it's just it doesn't go the yep. way I feel the first two went. Totally. Because I get in my head by then. Totally. After two swings, then I'm totally messed up in the head. So totally. is that a misconception as well? You don't need to take two practice swings? It's a misconception because um, – Because there are people out there that do zero practice swings and they hit fantastic shots all the time. I am one that benefits from two practice swings. So I am a proponent of it for myself and for some people that it works for. But I've definitely have had students that I give them, hey, make two practice swings, then hit the ball and it doesn't work for them. And it's hard to try to ram a square peg into a circle, you know, so if it's not working it's not for everyone. And that's really the big thing about this whole misconception list is that the, the route to better golf, there is no one thing that's going to fit for everybody. You have to find what's right for you. And if it's not working, don't beat your head against the wall until it gets there. Don't keep running backwards, turn around and get the heck out of there. Cause the bear is going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. Less thinking for me, the better. Yes. So. I know. And I've had students that say, yeah, I'm wasting my practice swings, you know, and, and then I step up to the ball. So if you're having success with zero practice swings and just stepping up and hitting it all the power to you. And I, and I, and I agree. So here's your fifth lesson. Do yeah. that instead. Yeah. Perfect. Because I, sometimes I'm, thinking I need to be doing all these practice swings to get better and get in my head about that as well. And then I just go ahead and hit it first time. Boom. Yeah. Perfect. I love that for you. And your routine is what helps you be the most confident over the golf ball. So whatever that routine is, that's, that's up to you. Yeah. It's nothing to do with whatever someone else tells you. That's absolutely right. You know, your goal with a routine is to step over the golf ball and feel as confident as possible. Yep. And tension free. Yep. Justin, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Tori. Thank you for always teaching us with enthusiasm and high energy and for the love of the game, because sometimes, you know, our love for the game is not as high as it can be. Yeah. So thank you for bringing it's my wonderful pleasure. energy. My pleasure. And Babes Golf crew, Alex, you're so freaking lucky to have all these women surrounding you. And not only you get to enjoy the game with some of your best friends, but you get to work the business too with some of your best friends. Yeah. And we, that is we live amazing. The babe life. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. I had a member the other day, which it's not the first time, but it's right in my brain because it happened the other day. And she said, babes golf. I'm going to cry. She said, babes golf changed her life. Yeah. Because she didn't have community and like community is everything. Yeah. And some people just need that mm-hmm. to have that quality of life and golf. As far as I'm concerned is the best community in the world. So yeah. if you're thinking about golfing, picking up that golf club. Yeah. We wouldn't it. know you Tori without yeah. golf. We wouldn't know you. I wouldn't know any of these incredible women. We've had the most incredible past few days. Yeah. Yep. Thanks to Alex. Babes golf exists. Yeah. 
And also thanks to you guys for being able to branch off of Alex and make it a wider spread. Yep. Because Alex needs you as much as you need her. 100%. So. I need more of you too. <laughs> Teamwork I don't know how I'm going to find more, but. Well, at the next time Justin Babes Golf is joining us, who knows? We might need to bring in 20 chairs. <laughs> <laughs> rent out a gymnasium. <laughs> I love that for us. <laughs> All right, ladies, thank you for being here. Thank and you. we are out. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the details on today's show. If you haven't already, please give a five-star written review on your favorite podcast platform or even screenshot this episode and send it to your golf buddies. Thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you on the first tee in a couple days.